Uh, hello everyone, welcome along to Live On Air this evening. It's my great pleasure to have uh, sitting in front of us Wallace Chapman, who's Radio New Zealand's Sunday morning host, as well as a long-term presenter of uh, Backbenchers, the television program that talks to politicians in New Zealand. Well, Wallace, with all of that TV and radio, I'd like you to just describe for us what's a working day like? as a host of these iconic <laughs> programs? A working day is uh, pretty much 80% uh, of my week, uh, David, is taken up with reading. So I do a, 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 an extraordinary amount of reading. Um, so it will start, well, the, the week will start with a, um, with, uh, a Monday morning phone call to my backbenchers team. So we, um, when it starts again, it starts again in May. So in those 20 weeks, pick up the phone Monday morning, 10 a.m. We have about a, a half an hour long a conference call uh, on who the MPs are going to be. We match the MPs with the topics. Uh, we discuss the sort of topics of the week, four, four big topics. Um, on the Tuesday morning, I meet with my Radio NZ presenters in Wellington and Auckland, and we discuss the topics for the Sunday. Uh, and so those two conference calls are, are the backbone, I guess, of my whole my whole week. Then from there, uh, I get given, or I go out and find a whole lot of reading material and research material. Um, so, for example, uh, for backbenchers, it might be, you know, water quality or inequality, or um, or, 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 or uh, raising GST, or or, or cutting. Or, or, or introducing tobacco tax, that type of thing. Do a whole lot of background reading for that. Uh, and then for the Sunday morning RNZ, uh, there's five hours, big show, lots of interviews. Uh, and they're often long interviews. Mm -hmm. so, so that takes up um, uh, a, a lot of research time. Probably probably hundreds of pages for, the, for, for, for that one show. It's quite extraordinary. So I'm just reading. So for example, today I, I got home uh, 12 o'clock, had a nap for an hour and a half, got back up and got a big book to read for two weeks' time, so to start reading all over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, today, let's just take today as an example. Uh, early on in the RNZ program, you were talking to a former Prime Minister of the country, Sir Geoffrey Palmer. Uh, who instituted a, 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 some very considerable changes um, to how we understand things like Treaty of Waitangi and so on. Um, I found that a fascinating interview, but the questions you were asking, I, I considered you must have spent a very, very long time researching, because that was uh, a, a whole series of things that related to his political life short political life as Prime Minister. Oh, just a minor correction there, David. What's happened there is uh, that, that series with uh, an hour of Prime Ministers, that was actually uh, Guy and Espina, um, which is quite unusual. What's happened is that because Sunday morning... Oh, was has, that Guy on, was it? Yes, right. uh, but, but because Sunday morning has quite a big audience, uh, and particularly that first hour, has got a, quite a big uh, political audience, uh, they decided to put their podcast onto my show, um, so um, so that's what happened there. So every, <laughs> every every particular week, there's going to be a different prime minister, uh, and I've got to say that guy on uh, with that particular series, uh, he did a lot of work, extraordinary. He he actually took six weeks off radio, uh, and mm. and, and uh, interviewed those prime ministers for the, the, the for the whole day actually. So it was cut down to one hour. Um, so, I mean, that's an example of the sort of breadth, really, that um, RNZ presenters can go to, to to get those sort of interviews. But uh, it, was a, it was a great listen. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the two of you must have an identical voice, but I, I suspect I that it's my age. I'm not, <laughs> not all that brilliant at <laughs> hearing. But what a, what a great thing the rnz sunday pro <laughs> uh what a great thing the rnz sunday program is because you you range over politics oh you name it yeah. your subjects 
really span just about every discipline imaginable. I, I think I think that's why I love it. I mean, it's a bit of a dream job for me, David. I mean, for example, you ask me if there's anything that I, I can recall, you know, over the last uh, three years, and it's quite hard to pick out particular things, um, but it is that diversity. I mean, getting the chance to play those long-form interviews uh, like that, and we've had, uh, we've spent, I've sat down for an hour with some very interesting people. For example, um, you know, um, well, one that I can recall uh, was a doctor called Robin Young, Dr. Robin Young. And his big research, uh, which I can relate to, was that it's shown now that uh, whereas unlike the past in the 50s or 60s, where doctors would show no empathy or no understanding of the patient's, patient's needs, if a doctor or a clinician shows you empathy, your health outcomes are better. If a doctor or clinician just puts their hand on your shoulder and says, you know what, how are you? Um, the patient is given this permission to actually sort of go to open up. And so there's a lot of, and Dr. Robin Young, he's an, he's an anesthetist. So there's a lot of research now about empathy in patient care. You know, that's the sort of topic that I love talking about. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating, you know. So you might jump from that to um, you know, interviewing a well-known musician, like um, a really, um, actually, a really topical one is tonight on the news. Um, Joan Baez was inducted into the into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, I talked to Joan Baez uh, about three months ago, uh, and that was a real treat, you know, to be able to talk with someone like that. Mm. Uh, and and this morning I was did I hear Pink Floyd? <laughs> yes, uh, I I, um, I tracked down because there was an early member of Pink Floyd. His name is Sid Barrett, uh, and Sid Barrett was one of the founding members. Uh, and um, uh, 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 and he left Pink Floyd very very early on. But to this day. To this very, very day, there is still an, an extraordinary fascination with who Sid Barrett was. And Sid Barrett actually had a lot of mental health problems. He, he actually had schizophrenia. So there's this whole mental health issue around his music that people sort of find quite fascinating. So I talked with his nephew, Ian Barrett, on the show today. But one thing off the show this morning, which was, which was actually very interesting in terms of a kind of a spirituality sort of thing, is um, I talked with a journalist called Julie Hill. And she went to a uh, town in California called Sedona. And Sedona is the world's largest mecca of new age or new age spirituality. And so you'll get people sort of traveling there. It's a town of 10,000 people, uh, but uh, it swells to 4 million for tourists every year. So people go there to try and find their spirit guides or their angels or, or experience um, the vortex. And so it was a very interesting discussion on what, um, within, what, what appeals to people when it comes to new age, and is that in any sense kind of taking, taking place of spirituality? So it was actually quite fascinating. Well, well that kind of leads to the, your own background, Wallace, uh, because you come from uh, a Methodist minister's um, background, or uh, well, your father was a Methodist minister, I should say, and uh, do, you, do you find somehow that that experience influences you consciously, or do you think possibly subconsciously in the way you do your interviews? I th that's actually a really good question, David, a really great question. I've actually, it's something I've, I've actually been um, thinking about a, a lot recently in terms of how I form opinions. Uh, form values, how I see the world, uh, and I can, I can, I never, I never, I never used to think much about it. But growing up from a very, very young age, and this is kind of six, seven, eight, nine, we were always surrounded in our household by very progressive thinking, extremely. Uh, not that I kind of recognise it, uh, but the sort of progressive. When I say progressive thinking, I mean, for example. Um, issues of social justice, uh, issues of justice, 
issue, issues of um, uh, respect and dignity to other people. That was very, very strong uh, with mum and dad. Uh, dad used to have these magazines um, called Pacific Island Monthly, um, other religious magazines. Uh, there was a magazine called New Internationalist, which I used to pick up and read randomly, but actually they were very, very, um, mm. very progressive magazines, you know. They, they, they touched on issues that you wouldn't ever see in the Nelson Evening Mail, you know. And so I was uh, subconsciously being exposed to some really, really uh, issues that I'd never heard in Nelson College or, you know, it was through Dad. Um, so, for example, the issue of, um, one example, you know, in the early 80s, uh, was the issue of gay rights. Now, Dad and Mum never, ever foisted uh, their issues of gay rights on me, never even discussed it. But there was a lot of reading material around. Uh, and I remember once uh, this, the, there was this um, gay priest who came over, um, I think from the States. And I asked Mum in a whisper, Mum, is Bob homosexual? Uh, and Mum said, yes, he is. But there's nothing wrong with that either, Wallace. <laughs> um, so those sort of early formative experiences <laughs> dealing with real, pretty progressive issues at the time, uh, this was this was uh, in an era in Nelson College. I was actually teased a few times when Dad was on the radio talking about uh, um, issues around gay issues in the church. He was on national radio, uh, interestingly. And I was kind of teased at school uh, about my father. Uh, so, you know, looking back, all I can say is pretty, pretty damn proud of them now. Uh, and and, and those, those issues now are front and centre in our society today. <laughs> That's great. Highly relevant. Uh, and so to have, have early experience and adoption of those particular issues when I was very, very young, you, you know, I couldn't get a better background uh, as a person in the media. So, you know, thanks mum and dad. Uh, and with regards to Methodism. Yeah. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I think it's those issues of of justice and social justice and look and looking out for others. Uh, I think that's that that that's what's percolated down to me. Well, one of the interesting things was that uh, I remember your father, who was also called Wallace Chapman, um, could could be quite. Yes outspoken in the annual Methodist conference yeah. uh, and uh, uh, oh, really? okay. because your dad was uh, Fe yeah, Fijian <laughs> uh, yeah, at the yeah, time absolutely. of the first coup in Fiji he argued strongly that, that the Methodist church in New Zealand should not interfere or make any statements about what was going on. Uh, now that was Colonel uh, Rambuka, uh, Rambuka's coup. Rambuka, that's right. And at the time, I, I think the conference uh, felt, you know, we, we're not we're not in agreement with this, Wallace, because it it seemed to be, uh, you know, against the kinds of things that we would um, normally uh, stand up for. But the interesting thing was that uh, the issues have never gone away in Fiji, and they're they're still with us no, they today. Um, so, in a sense, I think he was um, a somewhat prophetic, but lonely voice on that particular issue. Uh, but it, I mean, he had a lot of backing it's, in some of his other um, speeches. Yeah. It's it's amazing. It's extraordinary, really, that I mean that particular issue there. I mean, Dad felt very strongly about it, and uh, you know, and uh, and Fiji pol Fijian politics. If you think that New Zealand politics is complex, Fiji politics is very very complex, um, because, well, I can recall David uh, the moment driving in our blue Triumph down the road. I think it was in Taumanui, and he hears on the radio that there's been a coup in Fiji. And that Dr. Bavandra has been ousted by the military. He stopped the car and he cried. I couldn't believe it. I looked at my brothers. I looked at mum. I'd never seen dad like this. I'd never seen dad like this. And I, I couldn't understand why he was so upset. I mean, it's an island nation. But to him, 
here was his homeland, by essence, a very stable homeland. And for the first time, for many progressive people, Fiji had a real chance. Uh, under Dr. Vivandra, what he wanted to do was he wanted to make it a more equal society. He wanted to bring the, the Fiji Indians, who were always second-class citizens, always uh, in their homeland, uh, and the poorest. Um, he, Dr. Vivandra, as a full Fijian, wanted to bring uh, the Indian community into the fold and grow a more equal Fiji. And, um, and I think that, that Dr. Vivandra had a lot of values that Dad shared with around what justice really was, uh, social justice. So to hear him being ousted in a military coup, that affected Dad deeply. He, he wrote to the Queen. Um, but as you say, you know, I mean, that seed, of, that, seed of, that seed of stability never went away. Then you had George, the thug, George Spate, uh, and it kept on going. Uh, uh, La, 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 La Ngare, uh, Ngare, I think his name is, who was very, very tied to the National Council of Chiefs, a very nationalistic, you know, um, uh, Fiji for Fijians sort of movement. Um, so, no, it'd be very interesting to see what a dad would have thought of the latest administration, you know. So, um, yeah, inter inter interesting memory, interesting memory. Mm. Well, and, and also uh, because that whole business of the indigenous culture versus the indentured labour um, is not all that different in kind from the, the, what happened in New Zealand society with the colonial period and but it was the reverse in a sense that yes. uh, the indigenous culture was totally swamped and uh, I think Guy on Espiner's point too <laughs> rather yeah. than yeah. Wallace Chapman's point to Sir Jeffrey Palmer was that what we did uh, in those early days when Palmer was changing the law in this country was enable um, the fundamental writing of a, of a wrong um, yeah. that incorporated all people in, but it incorporated them in the treaty. Yes. And it wasn't a sham. I think that was Jeffrey Absolutely. Palmer's point. This treaty is not a sham. This treaty is, is a living document yeah. that, that we have to continue to oh, work absolutely. with. And in terms of the bicultural... Um, oh, sorry, Dave, I was just going to say, in terms of the biculturalism aspect, I mean, I think that's something where... The, uh, Again, what I can recall very strongly is that that bicultural component of Methodism was very strong with Dad, and also with my stepfather, Buddy, Buddy Tafari, as well, of course, Māori, you know, and um, and mm. going back, and I know it was quite a controversial, well, fairly controversial thing in the church, um, um, how to sort of get the sort of meeting of Pākehā and Māori as, as tight first, bicultural first, multicultural second, um, but it taught me a lot. Uh, it taught me a lot about Māori Pākehā uh, relationships. And I can tell you something, David, to this day, we're still talking about it. You know, it's, 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 it's never gone away. The issue is as uh, relevant as ever. Yeah, and it's, it's relevant to the whole of society. And in that way, I think Methodism reflected um, perhaps not more than some of the other denominations at the time, but then the Roman Catholics and the Anglicans in, in many respects embraced it more than the Methodists. Uh, well, those were the three churches that were tied up with the original signing of the treaty. So yeah. they, they all have a very significant history uh, that says we, we are on board with what is being done yeah. since 1840. Um, Wallace, the, the world today, in my opinion, seems to be more troubled than about 20 years ago. Uh, when we were on the verge of the millennium in 1999, I wrote, peace is breaking out everywhere, even in the Middle East, <laughs> even in the state of Israel with its Palestinian neighbours. And that seemed true. There was a mood of optimism for three or four years, but how embarrassing it now seems to have written that. Mm. Um, 
I, I wonder whether the media look at those situations worldwide differently or whether the situations have worsened. And I can't think of a person in New Zealand better able to answer that question than yourself because you're at that kind of cutting edge. You're constantly interviewing politicians and people from um, you know n numerous professions at the top of the at the top of their professions. So, what's your opinion? Are are the media approaching the same situations differently now? Uh, well, all, all I can say there first, I'll preface this by saying that I've got myself got no great insight into the issue, uh, albeit I've, I've long had an interest uh, in international affairs, uh, and so again. Uh, when I tailor the show with my producers, I really go for people who have got a lot to say uh, in in the world, international law, politics, and that type of thing. Um, is, is the world a better place than 20 years ago? What, what, when, when it comes to this current administration, Donald Trump, I guess, the, I suppose the key thing, uh, and again, uh, no great insights here, but the key thing uh, that uh, I'm very, very concerned about is the sheer unpredictability uh, of, of his administration. Whereas uh, previous administrations would lay out their agenda you can see, and you can generally see their path. For example, George Bush, um, his, his, uh, the, his neoconservative administration and the people he had around him like Paul Wolfowitz, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, all hawks, and you, but you knew in a sense which way they were going to take the world. The problem with Donald Trump is you don't know which way they're going to take the world. Now, I'm just echoing, for example, uh, I'm echoing um, uh, uh, a, a current well, a thinker who did a major talk on this in New York recently, a guy called Noam Chomsky, who was saying that uh, in the 60 years he's been following American politics, the one thing that he's very, very concerned about with Donald Trump is his sheer unpredictability and in some respects, to quote Noam Chomsky, uh, he's taking us to the precipice, to the edge of the world with his policies. So, for example, um, the world's most pressing issue, climate change, doesn't matter now. You know? You'll know, talk to scientists, as I have done on the radio show, um, who say that they're so, they're so gobsmacked uh, by the rate of climate change that they wouldn't... They're just watching the change before their very eyes, and they're stunned into silence. They're just seeing the rate of change so fast, never before in history. They said it's deeply concerning for humankind. Now you've got an administration in the US who is getting rid of every regulation. The Environment, Environmental Protection Authority, they've got a pro-oil man in there now, uh, ready to dismantle and dump on all the regulations. It's deeply concerning. So there are some really worrying issues. This latest issue, for example, uh, on this um, uh, this missile attack, uh, Tomahawk missile attack on Syria. Now, David, where is that going to take us if, if Russia wants to, wants to respond? So it's the sheer spontaneity and unpredictable, unpredictability of the administration uh, that is the number one concern for me. Now, with regards to the media uh, and how they report it, that's the second prong of this uh, 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 of this. Um, uh, of this point. How does the media relay that, portray that, and deliver that to the people in a factual, engaging basis, rely, relying solely on factual information? And that's the, that is the challenge that um, uh, modern commercial media organisa organisations have. One of, one of the things, Wallace, that's uh, really concerned me uh, is that Trump seems to uh, not pay much attention to the idea that leaders need to tell the truth. Uh, now, we know that leaders are experts at manipulating the truth, but at the same time, they do understand that in today's day and age, it's much easier to check the facts than it might have been a hundred years ago. And so their ability to 
manipulate public opinion. Uh, well, it would have initially been through newspapers um, and magazines or journals, uh, and then increasingly through radio, and then obviously latterly in post World War II and through television. Their ability to be able to withhold information has been getting less and less and less. So what we see with Donald Trump is today, um, you know, uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks is absolutely flavor of the day. But when some more WikiLeaks come out that are a bit damaging to the Trump administration, you know, he's, he's a terrible person. Now, we've seen exactly this happen with Putin. Uh, and Trump's inability to understand that other world leaders need the kind of stability that you're talking about. He, he, he doesn't have that particular grasp. Uh, and I've discussed, discussed this a couple of times with uh, some of my counterparts in Australia and live on air. And they, they regard Trump as actually the pinnacle of what we call postmodernism. So what you say today is all that counts. It doesn't matter that you have a history of a hundred or a thousand years or whatever. You simply sweep that aside and to, it's what you can do with public opinion today. Mm. And I think that the launching of those missiles, though perhaps from my perspective, justifiable as a measured response, actually was so totally opposite to what this guy campaigned on, that everyone is left in a kind of a vortex, if you like. I, I don't know whether it's a vortex of spirituality or a vortex of horror. Okay, Wallace, we've got a kind of closing question that's come in from one of our viewers, and uh, he would like to know, do you have any perspective on what's happening in the New Zealand political scene today? I think he might really mean, do you, he hopes that Labour and Greens will win and form a government. Do you have any inside information on that? Well, I'm not going to tell you who I vote for. Uh, what, 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 what I am going to do, I'm going to, um, I'm going to give you an overarching perspective on New Zealand politics. Uh, because as we were talking about, David, I, um, you know, we cover off international issues um, uh, pretty closely. And what I've seen in the last year or two has personally really deeply concerned me. Um, one of them is the rise of racism. Uh, you know, to hear one of my guests saying that um, an African American kid goes to school in the US now, 10 years old, and gets taunted because of his race, and that's happening today in 2017, I find that really shocking. The fact that we in Australia have a one nation, a big resurgence of Pauline Hansen, the fact that in parts of Europe there's a big rise to the right, uh, these are very, very worrying uh, and quite scary and chilling developments. In New Zealand, we haven't had that. You know, we have not had yet. We've got a, we've got a measure of moderateness that somehow keeps that off balance. And I think that we should be proud of ourselves um, for uh, um, for keeping that at bay. You know, we we might complain about the National Party. We might complain about Act. We might complain about MARA or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we are in a functioning MMP environment. Uh, it's working. Uh, yes, uh, voter turnout could be better. Yes, younger voter, voter turnout could be better. But things are looking, things are okay. Things are okay. Uh, in terms of the actual particular issues that I think are very, very important, one thing that I, along with uh, our, our guests here, have really noticed uh, just on a personal level in Auckland, uh, but also just reading the news, is inequality. Uh, and inequality is a uh, is entrenched, I would say, in New Zealand society today in a way that I've never seen it before, and it's deeply concerning, and we've got to do something about it. And whatever administration that comes in in the new election, be it Labour Greens, National, New Zealand First, they've got to tackle um, the disparaging gap, you know, between uh, between people. That's the, that's the number one issue for Kiwis right now. So that's my take on New Zealand politics.
What a great take that is too. Thank you very much indeed, Wallace. And we'll say good evening to everyone.